There have been many atrocities committed in the name of war. Since 1977, international humanitarian law has protected civilians from inhumane treatment and violence. However, during the first winter of the Second Sino-Japanese War, the Japanese displayed no such mercy. During the early 1900s, Japan had been asserting control over parts of China. In 1934, a pronouncement from Tokyo declared that all of China was to be under the direct supervision of Japan, and any important actions must have Japanese consent. The Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek preferred to focus on his campaign against the Chinese communists than worry about what Japan was doing. In 1936, Chiang was seized by his own forces and compelled to unite with the communists against the Japanese. Unfortunately for the Chinese, Japan's military was well prepared. They were able to take control of most of China's ports and had driven the Chinese army out of Shanghai by November 1937. The Japanese forces then set their sights on the nationalist capital of Nanking. The leader of the Japanese Imperial Army, General Iwani Matsui, didn't just want to gain military control over China. He aimed to break the Chinese spirit and crush any further ideas of resistance. Towards the end of November and beginning of December 1937, Matsui ordered Nanking to be destroyed. Over six weeks, Japanese soldiers would perform many atrocities against the civilians living in the city. Chiang Kai-shek was afraid of losing men in the upcoming battle and withdrew almost all official Chinese troops from Nanking. The soldiers that were left were untrained auxiliary troops ordered to hold the city at all costs. Chiang also made the controversial decision to forbid the evacuation of citizens. A safety zone was set up in a neutral area of the city to provide refuge for citizens still in Nanking. The International Committee for the Nanking Safety Zone comprised a small group of missionaries and Western businessmen. When the Chinese government abandoned the city on December 1st, the International Committee was left in charge. The remaining citizens were all ordered to the safety zone which consisted of roughly a dozen small refugee camps in an area approximately the size of New York Central Park. In the city, word spread of the Japanese's atrocities on their way to Nanking, including indulging and pillaging and killing contests. However, nothing could have prepared them for what was to come. The Japanese soldiers had strict orders to kill all captives, but nothing was off limits. The invading army believed that performing brutalities gave them strength and the men were free to loot and rape as they wished. On December 13, 1937, the first Japanese troops under General Matsui entered Nanking. Thousands of Chinese soldiers were hunted down and killed before being dumped in mass graves. The Japanese burned down the city walls, the surrounding forests, and people's homes. They looted every building they could, stealing everything of value from rich and poor alike. One survivor, Wen Xiu Liu Chao was 22 when the Japanese arrived in Nanking. She worked at the military hospital as a nurse and recalled seeing the soldiers enter the city. They separated the women and girls from their families before bayoneting babies and shooting elderly men. The staff lowered the Chinese nationalist flag in the hospital and raised the Red Cross hoping that the patients would be spared. However, when Japanese doctors took over the hospital, they made no such considerations. Among other things, they ordered Chinese staff to perform unnecessary amputations without anesthetics. The Japanese soldiers ravaged the city, slaughtering any unarmed civilians they came across and either disposing of the bodies or leaving them to rot in the street. Entire families were killed, including infants and the elderly. Back in Japan, magazines ran stories about how two soldiers, Toshiaki Mukai and Tsuyoshi Noda, challenged each other to see who could slaughter 100 people first. These men later admitted that their victims were defenseless people, with notice stating, we'd line them up and cut them down from one end of the line to the other. Notice showed no remorse for his actions, stating that the killings were no big deal. A writer for the New York Times, who was in Nanking at the time, wrote, I drove down to the waterfront in my car, and to get to the gate, I had to just climb over masses of bodies accumulated there. The car just had to drive over these dead bodies. At the waterfront, the writer witnessed the slaughter of 200 men in 10 minutes. An estimated 150,000 male war prisoners were massacred, along with 50,000 male civilians. 
But this slaughter pales in comparison to the fate that awaited the women and girls of Nanking. During the six weeks of the Rape of Nanking, also known as the Nanking Massacre, an estimated 20,000 to 80,000 women and girls were raped or sexually assaulted, often being mutilated or killed afterward. Soldiers went door to door dragging out any females they could find, including young children, and violently gang raping them in the street. One commander told his men, so that we will not have any problems on our hands, either pay them money or kill them in some obscure place after you have finished. The horror did not stop there, and the women were made to suffer in the most appalling ways. Pregnant women were cut open, and other rape victims were kept in agony by being sodomized with bayonets or bamboo sticks until they died. One missionary in Nanking, James M. McCallum, estimated that there were at least 1,000 cases of rape each night and many by day. One report from the International Committee records that on December 16th, seven girls, ages ranged from 16 to 21, were taken away from the military college. Five returned. Each girl was raped six or seven times daily. Another report reads, one old woman, 62 years old, went home near Hanisman, and Japanese soldiers came at night and wanted to rape her. She said she was too old, so the soldiers rammed a stick up her, but she survived to come back. A reporter from Life magazine describes how one woman was stripped, gang-raped, then bayoneted in the chest. Her entire family was massacred, including her one-year-old baby. Bodies littered the streets and riverbanks of Nanking, with the Japanese soldiers burning some of the corpses, dragging others into the Yangtze River, or disposing of them in mass graves. There were even some instances of people being buried alive. At first, the Japanese agreed to respect the Nanking safety zone. But in January of 1938, they dismantled it after declaring that order had been restored. By the time the worst of the attack was over, an estimated 200,000 people were dead. At the time, Europe was on the brink of World War II. The timing of the attack meant that none of the perpetrators of these horrific events were tried until the war ended. On November 4, 1948, 28 Japanese military and government officials were on trial for war crimes. 25 of the defendants were found guilty, with two dying during the lengthy trial and the other being declared insane. Seven of the men were executed, with 16 receiving life sentences and two receiving lesser sentences. This terrifying event's death toll and details have been widely disputed over the years, earning it the moniker the Forgotten Holocaust. Estimates of the death toll range from 40,000 to 300,000. Denials of the atrocities continue despite many first-hand accounts and photographic evidence. In 1972, when the right-wing political party began to rise in Japan, these denials started to come to the forefront. The Japanese Ministry of Education headed a campaign in 1982 to rewrite history books, including distorting the events in Nanking. Many Japanese historians at the time believed that the estimated numbers of those killed were exaggerated and various books were written that declared the massacre had never happened. The shocking nature of these events contributed to the denials, and in 1984, the Japanese Army Veterans Association attempted to refute the occurrence of the massacre by interviewing Japanese veterans who were present during the invasion of Nanking. However, they were surprised to find that many of the ex-soldiers interviewed were forthcoming about the atrocities committed. Instead of giving them the ammunition to discredit the accounts of what happened in Nanking, they were forced to run an apology instead. Whatever the severity of war or special circumstances of war psychology, we just lose words faced with this mass illegal killing. As those who are related to the pre-war military, we simply apologize deeply to the people of China. It was truly a regrettable act of barbarity. In 1987, a retired Japanese soldier called Shiro Azuma was determined to share his story and publish his diary containing details of the Japanese attack. He had been part of the Imperial Army and had taken part in the atrocities committed in Nanking. Offering an insight into the mindset of the invading soldiers, he recalled, We were taught that we were a superior race since we lived only for the sake of a human god, our emperor. But the Chinese were not, so we held nothing but contempt for them. He tells how the Japanese military training taught them that human life had no value, producing an army of men with no compassion. Azuma admits that there were many rapes and the women were always killed. 
When they were being raped, the women were human. But once the rape was finished, they became pig's flesh. Azuma was sued for libel and had many threats levied against him for divulging this information. But he vowed to keep fighting for the right to talk about what happened. Azuma was inspired to share his story after a Chinese soldier spared his life at the end of the war. His savior had narrowly escaped death at the hands of the Japanese and nonetheless showed him mercy. Despite these admissions, the widespread denial continued. In 1990, Japanese government officials stated categorically that the rape of Nanking was a lie when in November, the deputy Japanese consul in Houston told Americans that the massacre never occurred. Shintaro Ishihara was quoted as saying, People say that the Japanese made a holocaust there, but that is not true. It is a story made up by the Chinese. In 1995, the first official apology for the atrocities was issued by Tomichi Muyama, the Prime Minister of Japan at the time. Marking the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, Muriyama said, In the hope that no such mistake be made in the future, I regard, in a spirit of humility, these irrefutable facts of history, and express here once again my feelings of deep remorse and state my heartfelt apology. Ten years later, this sentiment was reflected by Prime Minister Yunichiro Koizumi. However, in 2015, on the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe caused controversy when his statement expressed regret for the atrocity but did not contain an apology. He instead said, We must not let our children, grandchildren, and even further generations to come who have nothing to do with that war be predestined to apologize. Many felt that this sentiment, in light of the historical denial of the event, was an insufficient reckoning of the wartime crimes of Japan. In today's world, many people are coming to terms with the more unpleasant aspects of our history. This realization can be jarring and disconcerting, but by learning from the mistakes of the past, we can hope to avoid them in the future. To paraphrase Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, we, across generations, must squarely face the history of the past. We have the responsibility to inherit the past in all humbleness and pass it on to the future. To learn more about the rape of Nanking, check out our book, The Rape of Nanking, the Nanking Massacre that occurred during the Second Sino-Japanese War. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.